This is the Music Therapy Chronicles podcast interview with Veda Hingert McDonald. Basically involves learning how natural ecosystems work and interact and designing similar ecosystems that also benefit people like growing food um, but in a way that's sustainable and and has everybody important involved. You're listening to the Music Therapy Chronicles, a podcast about music therapy from a variety of perspectives. Our ambition is to inspire and connect listeners through meaningful conversations, just like a music therapy conference you can listen to anywhere. My name is Trisha Kayati, and I am a board-certified music therapist from the New England region. If you like what you hear, join our group on Facebook and share your own insights and thoughts about the episodes. You can also connect with us on social media and online at Music Therapy Chronicles. Welcome back to the Music Therapy Chronicles. I hope your week is off to a great start or end, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, Today's conversation is a really thought-provoking one. Um, Veda and I, (laughs) we could have talked for hours probably about these topics. And so in this conversation, Veda and I dive into kind of just like the, the music ecosystem. She is a performance Uh, major and we talk about kind of how our music therapy clinical experience overlaps with her experience as a performer you know why and how music relates to everyone the audience the musicians themselves our clients and we also tie into you know how that affects other areas of our life we specifically talk about environmentalism and yeah, this is just like a, a very thought provoking conversation. We were really like in the meat of it, talking things out, sharing personal experiences that related to these topics. And I, I hope you enjoy this conversation and you're excited to go away with some maybe abstract ideas to chew on for a little bit. So if you enjoy this show, please consider leaving us a rating and review. Those really help the podcast be more visible. Subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And please find us on social media at Music Therapy Chronicles um, and online at musictherapychronicles.com. Coming very soon uh, will be the free 14-day self care challenge that will be here on the podcast it'll be on social media and it will be through the newsletter uh, which you can get on the list for at musictherapychronicles.com and during this self-care challenge is when the doors will be opening for the music therapy chronicles self-care community if you haven't already listened to my episode with kate a few weeks ago about self-care and community you can hear more Uh, about the self-care community idea, the vision on that episode. But uh, yeah, I'll talk more about that during the self-care challenge as well. Uh, That's something that I'm really excited to launch to connect with you more through, to create community, to have these self-care experiences and support systems together. And I hope that you're as excited as I am for this. But for now, let's get into this conversation with Veda. All right, Veda, welcome to the Music Therapy Chronicles. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you on today because I think this is going to be a very unique conversation, um, but also really thought-provoking and informative. Thanks, I hope so. Yeah. So to start us off, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Yeah, my name is Veda. I'm a master's student right now at the University of Colorado in violin performance, 
and I am originally from Canada. Um, yeah, I'm mainly a violinist and I love string quartets and I also compose and do environmental activism things. Yeah, and we're going to kind of talk about the intersection of all those things and how they play into each other, which I think some people listening are going to be like, I don't understand how those overlap. And some people are going to say, yes, I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely didn't feel like they had any overlap for years and it was very confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell us like kind of where it started. Did it start like with your interest in music? Did it start with your inter interest in nature? Like where has this grown out of? Um, well, I think how much I love nature has always been part of my life and how much I love playing the violin has also kind of always been part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, neither ever felt like kind of my main thing or like what I needed to be doing forever. Um, for most of my life, uh, it was they were both just things that I enjoyed. Um, but I guess kind of around like late high school years, I it sort of hit me that I couldn't just like not play the violin forever. Mm. Um, so that's when I sort of started, decided to pursue that in a more professional way. And in terms of environmental stuff, yeah, I think kind of growing up in the forest <laughs> was the main factor um, just in how much I love nature and then kind of I think everyone has become much more aware of climate issues in the past few years and that definitely hit me pretty big too uh, and so I started getting involved a lot more locally in, in activism and stuff like that and learning how to grow food and um, yeah have more of like a hands-on approach um, yeah, I guess that's sort of where it started. So I'm curious if that impacted your decision to go to school in Colorado. Because I, from what <laughs> I understand, that's kind of like the vibe in Colorado. Grow your own food, like be <laughs> in touch with everything. Um, yeah, well, I am in Boulder, Colorado, which I think is known for that sort of eco mentality or hippie mentality, at least. I've only been here for a few weeks, so I'm not really sure yet. But um, But actually, no, it didn't really impact my decision. I'm here because I'm studying with teachers I'm really excited about. Um, yeah, and but definitely like the mountains and knowing that it, I was going to be in a beautiful place that I would enjoy living in mm. was a factor as opposed to like some random city somewhere I, I didn't really know was going to be kind of a, a scene I would like. Um, so yeah, I guess that was part of it. I love those two things that you touched on. So the first was teachers um, that you were like inspired to work with. And I think that's important because a lot of people, especially in undergrad, when they're looking at where to go to school, that's not really a variable they, they mm. dive into. Uh, and I think it's really important because you are heavily influenced by the people, the, by the mentors you have. And the other thing was kind of an aesthetic thing. Like you wanted to be in a place that felt beautiful and had, um, had those things that were comforting to you and like, that is another aspect that I think people have taken more time to acknowledge in the past year and a half, the importance of the environment, not necessarily mm -hmm. like earth environment, but also our living environment and where we are spending our time um, and how much that impacts us on the daily. Yeah. I mean, I know for me, I mean, just in general, I know that I feel better in a place mm -hmm. that I like, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but like, I, I know that if I'm in a place that feels beautiful, I'll like treat it with more beauty and I'll treat myself with more beauty and I'll treat my violin practice with more beauty. And so I think that, yeah, those factors are definitely a part of any sort of decision like that for me. I love that and how you're already tying it all together. Kind of like if you're able to acknowledge the beauty in something else, it encourages you to acknowledge it in other things and therefore bring out that beauty, like in mm. your playing, like you just said. I love that. Yeah. Cool. So you are studying to be a performer, to perform the violin. Yes. Um, so tell us about like what inspired you to want to go that route in music and then um, 
your connection with the audience, like why that calls to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I've been playing violin since I was like four or five. Um, I'm 22 now. And uh, I think initially, I w- I don't really understand why I was initially drawn to it. This is like mm. one of the great like mysteries to me is like, how did I know at age two that this was like going to be the thing that changed my life? Right. That <laughs> and I think like, I feel like everybody has this thing, like whether they get the opportunity to explore it or not. Um, There's like a thing that somehow you just, I don't know, your tiny child self knows it's going to be a big deal. Um, Because I kind of lived in the middle of nowhere and there wasn't really a violin teacher. And my parents were very supportive of the idea, but um, were kind of encouraging me to like start with piano because we know a piano teacher. And I was adamant that it was violin or nothing. And so, you know, my my parents worked really hard to find a violin teacher and eventually it worked out. But... um, But yeah, so I'm not sure like where that like incredible need came from, um, but it was there. And then I think um, there's a there's a sort of summer music festival that became really important to me called Music at Port Milford that happens in Prince Edward County in in Ontario um, that uh, my aunts had a have a farm in that area and they knew of this. um, It's a string chamber music camp so it's mostly string quartets and stuff like that um of like high school aged kids so when I was a really little kid they would start like bringing me to the performances and um this is like also just one of those things that similar to like how did I know I wanted to play the violin so badly like how did it not occur to me that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life was like at age four sitting through these like three hour student concerts (laughs) being like completely thrilled Mm. and like yeah how that never really like added up to me I'm not sure but yeah I just remember like feeling like there was something really special about that about like string players playing together (laughs) Mm. and this and so I ended up eventually being a student at this program and then um uh, a camp counselor at this program and that place is really important to me um and I think partially because of the environment because again it's a really beautiful place it's like a lot of it is playing music outside and you know going swimming on the breaks and things like yeah. that but um but it was sort of the first time I'd really gotten the opportunity to play with other people again like I came from kind of a small town where there weren't so many you know I had played in like fourth grade like recorder class or whatever but um yeah like really getting to dive in and play with other people who were really excited about playing with other people as well um and I think at that age like I was around like 13 or 14 when I started that um it was sort of just like really fun to do something I loved with other people who also love it but I think at that point too like it occurred to me that there was something really magic about it outside of just like hanging out with your friends and playing music yeah and I think I'm only now sort of starting to process like what that might have been but that that place and like seeing faculty performances of like string quartet playing at a really high incredible level and then getting to do that the next morning sort of thing was the thing that really did it for me yeah oh that's so cool um And not a trajectory that at least I hear often, like being able to acknowledge the, those, um, the salience of seeing people perform together, but also super cool that it was a music camp. So you got to have those musical experiences, but you were also at camp. So Mm -hmm. you were outside and like you were tying those things together, whether consciously or subconsciously. That's really cool. I also think it's interesting because in my experience, many of the people we create music with, we don't necessarily have other um, experiences with, for lack of a better phrase. So like the people I play music with in an ensemble, I don't necessarily hang out with and go swimming or go on Mm. a hike or, you know, do kind of those just regular human non-musical human civilian things you know like mundane things do you know what like I think that's a big reason why I 
ended up deciding to go into music was like, because, um, you know, and you, you mentioned sort of the thing about choosing a school or whatever because of the mm. teacher. And I think like that's been, because that was absolutely the number one reason I chose my undergrad school as well was because of the teacher I was really excited about. Um, and I think that that's because I've been so lucky to have so many incredible teachers who are like a lot of the most important people in my life. Yeah. And like in the context of, yeah, places like this camp, playing music with people and then having them be like all of my best friends <laughs> um, was sort of like, well, you know, even if you leave out the musical aspect and the career aspect, like I'm going to go into the field where all of my favorite people are working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I think, and so you can correct me because you you are, we haven't said this explicitly for the the listeners, but you're not a music therapist, right? You're studying to be a performer. And right, yeah. And me as a music therapist and many of us, it's a very isolating field. And mm. like we're saying, music is such an intimate thing that we want to connect with people and we want to share and we want to make connections. That's why we love music. So the fact that you have gone into a music field where you are around other performing musicians all the time is such a paradox for many of us mm -hmm. who have gone into a music field where we're super isolated. We're connecting with people through music, but those aren't necessarily, uh, they're not our peers, they're clients, right? There, there needs sure. to be a separation in that relationship. And that's a really interesting thought that I've just had. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, that is interesting. And that I honestly, I know very little about the sort of clinical world of music therapy. So that's mm -hmm. interesting to hear that. Um, Cause I think like, I think of that sort of isolating feature as, you know, if you're a soloist or something, spending a lot of time practicing mm -hmm. alone, or if you're a composer, especially doing a lot of work alone, if you're not working like directly with performers yeah. or something like that. Um, but definitely like collaboration is like the most, special part of my life I think and like the main thing I want to do um and I think one of the big things that attracts me specifically to string quartet playing is the incredible like interwovenness and like uh, mutual dependence and intimacy that that career has to have it has to be part of that job or it doesn't work which I think is so special like the idea that relying on each other and sort of being each other's main people in some way is part of the job. <laughs> yeah. When I was in undergrad, there were a lot of us, we had to take, you know, classical lessons on our main instrument. I played the clarinet. I have never brought a clarinet into a therapy session. I totally could. People do stuff like that, but I haven't. Uh, but in undergrad, a lot of us were really struggling to make the connect about like, why am I playing in ensembles and learning all this stuff? And then I have to go do this clinical music, which like is a whole different world. And mm. one of our uh, mentors said, I think she even used a string quartet. She's like, well, when you're a, or a small ensemble, I'll say when you're in a small ensemble and like, you're all very attuned to each other. You're, you're seeing gestures, you're following each other. Like it's, you're learning how to, almost telepathically right communicate <laughs> to make this music and so all you got to do is swap out those people for the people in your session and you're mm. a small ensemble and it's the same thing you know you're obviously not necessarily reading off a sheet of music and practicing the same thing repetitively but it's the same idea that's how you make the transfer into the clinical setting so yeah like we're saying you're still creating those really intimate connections it's just um, different <laughs> based on yeah. what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I love that. I think because another sort of part and sort of exactly what we're talking about, I guess, is like the amazing power that playing music with people has to sort of encourage empathy mm. in sort of all directions. Like, I like to talk about the like empathy train <laughs> as a performer. I feel like we're in a really special position between composer and audience. That means that we have like the two way empathy street there of like, I get the beautiful privilege of being given music from composers 
you know, living or dead <laughs> and, um, and getting to work with it and think about it and feel with it and get to know a little bit about that composer's feelings and things like that. And that I also have the privilege of giving something to an audience. Mm. Um, yeah, I love that. Just getting to be between those. And I think maybe that that's also related to like how much I love people and collaboration is like getting to be on both sides of that, the sort of giving and receiving feels really good. <laughs> yeah. I think it was uh, Percy Granger. I was playing a song or we, um, the, my ensemble in college was playing one of his songs and the, it, it basically under the music, it said play feelingly. <laughs> like that was the description. And our, uh, band director was saying like you know Percy Granger like saw music and I could be using the wrong composer if someone listening is like no that's <laughs> the wrong person okay fine correct me anyway but anyway music is like this thing that just exists and like we try and put it in these notes and these boxes and like it doesn't really fit and so that's why he would use things like play feelingly and my studio professor had a very similar thing he was like music is this outside of you thing and you are the vessel to like bring the music into this plane and your technical skill on the instrument is what like either in allows you to do that or inhibits you in doing that. And so kind of what you're saying, like we, we sit in this middle where like the music is there and then the composer takes it and tries to put it into notes for us. And then we need to interpret those notes and turn them into something to give to the audience to try and take this whole train and like bring the music mm. into existence and then as soon as we create it it goes away <laughs> yeah there's something really beautiful about that but on the other hand like I think it can be a lot simpler and way more <laughs> tangible and way more embodied too like I mm. part of me doesn't love that idea of like you're a vessel for this like otherworldly music creature tell me about that like I I think I relate more to just being with people and yeah. and um and obviously there's like yeah whatever music is but also like it comes out of like the physical things I do with my body to play you know like I don't I don't think it's like really that far removed to be honest um and um yeah I think just Maybe maybe what you're saying is totally more accurate, but to me, I think it's a little more useful to think about it as being very local and yeah. very tangible and um, practical and a thing that can be done every day by everybody. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, and like the the question about um, the audience. Um, I guess sort of what I was saying about the empathy chain idea is that I, I think the thing that I have the most questions about is like, how do we actually get the audience to very much feel like they're actually part of that? And mm. the idea that, um, that I've been thinking about a lot is like this sort of ecosystem mentality um, that, and maybe, yeah, maybe I'll get into that a bit more, but um, but that I think is a big part of why I love string quartet playing is that that's a place in my life where I really feel that sensation of being part of a, a web of interwovenness and how special that feels. And I think what I would love to figure out is how everyone who is involved in that web, which involves the audience and the composers and everybody who I've ever met and anybody who's ever heard music before and donors and concert presenters and, you know, people who make instruments and whatever, um, how performers can achieve having all those people actually feel that, that they're a really important member of that ecosystem. Yeah. So I, 
I, you, so you mentioned the web and like all these different people included in that. So can you expound on that more and the, the ecosystem? Like, I love that word in this context, but I also, I just want to hear more of what you think about that ecosystem. Sure. Yeah. I think, well, that, that really came from, um, I've been studying permaculture, mm -hmm. which is like the, um, it's like a sustainable form of agriculture that involves like a lot of perennials and um, basically involves learning how natural ecosystems work and interact and designing similar ecosystems that also benefit people like growing food, um, but in a way that's sustainable and and has everybody important involved which is mm -hmm. all of the wildlife and all of the soil microbes and you know healthy soil and um whatever all this sort of stuff um so I I sort of fell in love with that for a million reasons and one of them that I think is significant here is that um as I was sort of getting deeper into environmental activism I was sort of encountering a lot of the very like negative forward type of activism like don't um go on an airplane and like mm. don't have a carbon footprint like do as little as you can to mitigate the like inherent harm that you as a person do and I think I was sort of buying into that for a while but I I think I'm just not interested in being part of something that the main message is you're a bad person and you have to do as little as you can rather than there's something you can do that's like really beautiful and you have a lot of power um which i found in permaculture that that like you as a person have the power not only to do less harm but do a lot of good in restoring ecosystems and growing food for your neighbors and um, learning about the world around you and feeling more connected with it. And mm -hmm. I think to me, and there's a million ways that environmental stuff can be done and I don't want to, you know, put anybody's method down. I think it's all, it all has a place for sure. But I think the place that I found myself most interested in personally is um, that sort of like, what can we do to have people feel more empowered that they have actually a really strong capacity to do amazing things, including, um, you know, in environmental scenarios. I forget yeah. what your actual question was. <laughs> no, but I love that. So because so permaculture, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're touching on so many different aspects of um, doing something instead of avoiding doing other doing something positive instead of avoiding doing negative things. So mm -hmm. right with permaculture, you're like you said, you're, you're creating healthier soil and that therefore positively impacts, um, is it the ozone or like CO2? Like, you know, like what's that book? Kiss the ground where like the soil literally could be our solution to our CO2 problem. So, right, you're creating mm. soil and like you have plants and then you're eating those plants, which means you're not contributing to the industrialization of our food. And then if you're doing permaculture, it's probably likely you have a compost pile and therefore <laughs> you're not contributing to food waste. And like, there's just, like you said, you're just focusing on this one thing, but you're doing all of these other positive things instead of thinking like, I can't drive my car. I can't buy plastic. I can't go on an airplane. I can't like yeah. all these things, all these, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely all those factors of like every different way that permaculture is a great solution or part mm -hmm. of a great solution. But I think like, honestly, what is the most exciting to me is what a joyous solution it is. Yeah. That it's something that, I mean, like everybody can learn very quickly how to plant a fruit tree or something you know like everybody can get involved with that and also um it's something that's really fun to do with other people <laughs> and it's uh and it, I don't think anybody ever comes away from you know building a food forest together as a community feeling bad about themselves you know yeah. like, I think it's a it's a really like 
fun thing to do that I think has a, or I have seen and, you know, ha- has a, a really amazing impact, both sort of socially and environmentally, which, yeah, I think that was a big part of what got me so interested in it. And um, for a moment, I guess those, I felt very separate from music making, you know, but, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm finding it to be very similar (laughs) and I think that's a big part of that is like um how joyous and interconnected the process is but also Mm -hmm. um just from learning more about permaculture and doing more of it um I learned more about ecosystems and every time I would you know read anything from my permaculture books or anything uh I just kept on thinking like this is I'm not just learning about forests I'm learning about how to treat people and how to be gentle with myself and um because there are all these things about like I mean a you know a monocrop um Mm. agriculture like there's a million reasons that that doesn't work uh and one of them is soil depletion that it's so sort of for lack of a better word boring (laughs) to to the soil (laughs) that, that um that yeah nobody's really benefiting from that um Whereas ecosystems thrive with maximum diversity Mm. and yeah, I don't know, just like values like that, 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 you know, the more interwoven relationships possible in a network, the stronger it is. And I think there's also to me something really comforting about like deriving values like that from something that's such a like fundamental earthly truth, if that makes sense, you know, it's like, this just is the way that ecosystems work. Like we didn't design that. We didn't like really discover anything about it. It's just like, that's, that's how the earth, you know, figured out how to be in balance. And I think, yeah, I think I kind of take comfort in like feeling grounded in those principles (laughs) because they Mm -hmm. feel real. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I think, I think just, um, yeah, that feeling, part of an ecosystem ourselves and learning how to treat people in a way that feels in community with one another is important to me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and like you're saying, you're touching on the fact that these two seemingly, sorry, I don't know if that was loud, uh, seemingly different things in your life are both what are allowing you to create connection with others and like to, positively influence each other in a mutual relationship right so yeah have have you heard of horticulture therapy um no but I it's, can kind of it, imagine what would be involved it's a whole thing I had um someone who is a horticulture therapist on a few months ago but yeah it's it's what you're saying but it's right the, the clinical application of that uh because it's true it's like these things happen naturally just like the ecosystem functions naturally when we work together to create something beautiful, to, to grow food, to work together, to have a harvest, like you're naturally going to create this ecosystem with other people. Mm. And that of course parallels how the earth's ecosystem works together to grow food. I I, I don't know if I'm making (laughs) sense. Like (laughs) Earth's ecosystem does the garden, right? And we tend to the garden. So while while that stuff is growing, our relationships to each other are growing. And in the end, we get to eat the food. (laughs) Yeah. And I think also like just to more concretely bring it back to string quartets, um, like the the thing that sort of hit me about that being an ecosystem. Well, actually, okay, tell you the truth. You asked sort of why I'm here in Colorado. One of the big reasons is like, I was so sad during the like sort of main bit of the pandemic where, Mm. um, you know, I was, I was not going to school. I wasn't seeing my teacher. I wasn't really playing a lot with people. Um, And I was going through a terrible breakup and like everything was a disaster. (laughs) And, um, and I was listening to a lot of interviews with string quartets to sort of like feel like I was part of that community without like being so sad from like watching people play string quartets when I couldn't Uh (laughs) um and anyway I came across one uh with the Takash Quartet um and the sort of new second violinist Harumi Rhodes said something 
incredibly beautiful that sort of felt like it synthesized everything I've been like trying to explain for years about why I love string quartet playing, which is kind of this idea of the ecosystem. And anyway, that's who I study with now <laughs> in Colorado. Uh, so that's sort of how that happened, I guess. Wow. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, that idea that sort of the main people in the quartet, the four people in the quartet are not the only part of that ecosystem. Um, there is that incredibly important closeness and that's a whole sort of other topic of conversation of like how, um, how amazing it feels to trust people Mm. and how amazing, maybe even more so it feels to be trusted by people and to have that amazing sense of responsibility that to me is such an honor. Do you know what I mean? Like when you feel like, you have the sort of, I mean, maybe, maybe this is a, I'd be curious actually, like um, from a therapist perspective, because I, my impression of that job is that it probably feels good to feel like you're contributing positively to someone's life. (laughs) And (laughs) part of it. (laughs) I feel like everybody in a string quartet, but especially like, I love playing second violin because of the amazing role of like, getting the privilege of supporting so deeply. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Seems okay. like that resonated. <laughs> You're speaking to my heart because I I played clarinet right all the way through college. I marched in a drum corps for five years and mm. I only, and I, both of those ensembles only ever sat in a third chair by choice. I, well, you don't sit when you're in a marching ensemble, but <laughs> <laughs> I was only ever in a third position because like, you know, no bass, no band. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, that's what I want to do. Like, I just want to be here and like watch the first chairs do their thing and just support them. So that, that really got to me. <laughs> um, from a therapist perspective, everything you're saying about like being supported and doing the support Yes. So, and this is what I'll compare it to. Um, at one of our conferences in in the Mid Atlantic region, we would do a a drum circle on one of the nights of the conference, and we also do drum circles in our sessions or community drumming, um, depending on what language you use. So, when we're doing it at conference, everyone there is a musician. And there is that like baseline knowledge, understanding and trust, right? Like everyone Mm kind of knows music. We do it. When you do it in a session, there will be some people there who innately know that like I am a musical being and I can play and I can trust Mm -hmm. myself and trust others. And then there will be the people in sessions who think I can't do music. I'm not musical. I can't go there. And so it's our job to bring them in and to be like, yes, you can. And this is how, and we're going to support you in doing it. Um, And that is one of those supportive things that I love doing as a therapist. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I love that. Um, I think that sort of also relates to the idea of sort of bringing in the audience in that sense, though maybe it's, I think it's less direct um, than what you do, but um, I would like it to feel just as direct, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think a big part of it is that sense of mutualism, which mm-hmm. to me, mutualism, I don't know if there's like, there's probably a real definition that I've never investigated, but it's a really important word to me. So I should probably look it up at some point, but how it feels to me is that sense of um, that the relationship isn't just that I'm the you know, supportive one and you're the one being supported, but yeah. that it's a really deeply two-way version of that. Mm. <laughs> and I think that's, I feel like this whole time, just sort of like trying to pin down like what's so special to me about string quartet playing. But I think like that's the sort of deepest version of that is like yeah. that the four people, everybody is like very mutual about that sense of trust and responsibility and to me what's really important is how beautiful the sense of trust and responsibility is and has to be and that we like learn to figure out how that can be a privilege 
um, rather mm-hmm. than like kind of a annoying sense of responsibility to do something. But um, but that I think my desire in how everyone else in that ecosystem especially audiences because I think that's like kind of who we have a main responsibility to is like composers and audience as performer but everybody else who's involved definitely should be involved here too but um but that I want the I want the audience to really deeply feel somehow how much we're putting their our trust in them Mm. Because I think, like, I don't want to go on stage and just, you know, play as if anyone in the world is in that audience. It's, like, that very specific group of people that's there that very specific night. And that I want for, (laughs) on both ends, for that to be a intimate experience. Mm. I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this very well. Yeah. I think like I'm trying to sort of get to the idea of I am trusting you, the audience, and I want to provide you with the feeling of beautiful responsibility that the audience has. I think I'm I'm all, I want to endow you with this responsibility and I want to figure out how you can love that and how that can be meaningful to you. Yeah. I'm going to relate that to my marching arts experience um, okay. because one of the differences I don't know how familiar you are with the marching arts. So Not marching band, drum corps, winter guard international. No idea. One of the biggest differences is, you know, people are running around while they play their instruments. Right. Um, The (laughs) other big difference is that the audience doesn't have to wait till the end of a piece to applaud. Mm. And I loved that about the marching arts. And this is where I think I'm going to tie it in is like, you know, when you've got the audience, you know, when they're there with you, you know, when they're engaged because they're going to tell you. They're going to scream. They're going to clap. They're going to throw babies. If you get that example, listeners, (laughs) thank you. Um, Like, you you know you're there with it. And you can see in um, the marching arts are are a score-based competition, right? So it's up to the judges to tell you if you did well. You can see in performances where the audiences were engaged and the energy was going back and forth. Like they're they're screaming at the performers. The performance are giving the show of their life, and you'll see that in the scores. And ensembles will jump above each other because like there was just this connection. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I always loved that, and I never really enjoyed. I never liked being a solo performer, but in ensemble performances like in regular band on a stage that was always the hardest for me I was like the audience can't clap like they could be Um, so into what we're doing but like you can feel it energetically but otherwise you don't know I don't know that always felt very separative to me yeah do you know what that brings up something so interesting to me because I feel like the topic of like accessibility and classical music Mm. is obviously huge and like two billion dimensions but like one of those dimensions is that idea of like kind of concert etiquette and like um and I have such mixed feelings about it because on the one hand I'm I'm so with you on like I want people to be expressive and feel like if that's the way that they react to things they're excited about that they can do that but on the other hand like I so love and kind of revere the sort of tradition not tradition Mm -hmm. I mean that word sort of you know anyway (laughs) but uh but like the the reverence of the concert experience yeah I think because you know I've had I've certainly had times in concert where the silence is such a incredibly magical part of that and if someone had screamed woo or whatever it would have I think ruined it for a lot of people and um I don't know it's it's just yeah 
I think, and this absolutely is a big part of exactly like what I'm thinking about, you know, with this sort of like how the audience can feel a sense of ownership over their concert experience and feel like they're a really integral part of what's going on. If they feel like the protocol of a concert is keeping them from that, then like we have to talk about it. Yeah. Um, And I know that for some people that is a big part of it is like, when do I clap? Like, am I wearing the right thing? Mm. Um, Like, what if I come late? Like there's so many sort of weird barriers that suck, but also like when everyone is on the same page about what the experience is, no matter what the rules are, if we all agree on the rules, I think that it's really magical, but I don't really know how to do that all the time. (laughs) Agreed. I, I think that's part of why I n- never liked solo performance because mm. I I maybe this is a me thing I want that feedback like I just like I want I want to make music with my audience which makes them not an audience I guess and that's totally a me thing uh, but yeah it's also interesting so your your string quartets are much more finite than again I'll use my marching arts example so you have four people in a quartet. Um, I used to perform in an ensemble of 150 to 200 people across a hundred yard football field. (laughs) The audience is, you know, in the stands. So they're another hundred to 200 yards away from you. The biggest place I ever performed is Lucas Oil Stadium. So you have people like a hundred rows up in the air, you know, and, and creating like that ecosystem, making it feel super microcosm when like you're filling a whole football stadium and everyone's having this experience together uh yeah interesting thing to explore like how 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 the micro and the macro like can give you the same experience even yeah I'm I'm really really curious about that because I think I've had a long-standing kind of political loathing of the Mm. symphony orchestra (laughs) and and I think it's exactly for that reason that I've never figured out or felt or experienced the type of intimacy and connection Mm. and um flexibility I guess of chamber music in that like larger setting and that's both as an orchestral player and as an audience member I've just never really found that or it never really occurred to me that that could be possible. But I think kind of as with everything, it's the institution's fault and not the <laughs> like music making. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like I, cause I, I think maybe to the point of what you're saying, a huge group of people who are experiencing that together with a huge audience, maybe is like in some way even more special because it's hard to get there. I mean, yeah. it's hard to get there with one person, let alone four, let alone a hundred. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, sort of now having an orchestral experience that at least feels kind of like beautiful and enjoyable, kind of maybe for the first time, at least in a long time. <laughs> but, and it is, it is sort of occurring to me of like, if we are really invested in this in the same way that we're invested in chamber music and solo performance and things like that, like mm. maybe it's, a, maybe it's really interesting actually. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you're having that. I'll also say this, the, the group I performed with um, the marching arts, mm-hmm. the drum player, we would rehearse 15 hours a day for several months. So like it, I, we would wake up at seven in the morning and we would go to bed at 10 and it was like, you know, you, you work out together, you eat together, you work on your actual performance together. So part of it is like, yes, it's an ensemble experience, but we're not only together like five hours a week or mm. one hour a week. Like, right. We're living together. <laughs> so um, yeah. the intimacy of that is kind of unavoidable. And also that's a lot of personalities. Like that's, I think that's part of like quartet versus ensemble is four personalities versus 40 personalities for sure four people's attention spans versus four <laughs> people's attention spans yeah. like that's a lot uh, in a quartet you know, generally you don't have a conductor right you really have to watch each other where 
with an ensemble, you have a conductor and hopefully he's going to tell you if something's going wrong on the other <laughs> side of the stage. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And just honestly, just the idea of a large ensemble that has that kind of, I don't know, commitment, I guess. That, is that was one of our values. Intense. Like I, I, I don't think I've ever experienced that. Like commitment in a general sense, but commitment in the sense of that many hours a day doing that many different activities together that you're not, as as you were saying before, so you're not just playing together, you're living together, maybe you're going swimming together. You're yeah, I was just thinking that ties back to camp. I guess <laughs> yeah. I, I have had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's something that I'm fascinated with in quartet playing. Like I've only played in like student quartets and stuff. I've never, um, sort of my big uh dreamy goal is like to you know play in a full-time sort of real Mm -hmm. deal string quartet that wants to be together forever and ever and you know the sort of like classic analogy is that a quartet is like a marriage four ways Mm. I forget who that's a direct quote of but it's become sort of just a thing um but I think that's a big part of what I love about it is like (laughs) um yeah, the idea that you could find your quartet soulmates or whatever, or just like, um, and I'm yeah, I've been really fascinated by sort of different quartet dynamics. Like there are some quartets who do sort of view it as a more of a business relationship and they mm. don't necessarily have dinner together and they, you know, yeah, maybe they wouldn't go swimming in the lake together <laughs> and they have their lives outside of, and obviously like, every sort of healthy relationship of any level like you have your life outside of that thing but I'm yeah I'm so fascinated by how different quartets figure that out and make that work and what they want from it because yeah kind of the example that I'm referring to is the Guarneri Quartet um speaks about how they viewed that relationship more as a as business partners and not necessarily as friends and not necessarily as like I don't know whatever the sort of like business partner marriage is (laughs) yeah but they were incredibly successful and certainly sounded like a team whether they treated each other as one or not I don't I don't really know but yeah I don't know it's just interesting to me how people navigate the dynamic have you heard of Canadian brass yes Okay. I don't know much about them, though. They're a quartet or a quintet, and right now I don't know, and I feel silly for not knowing. But uh, And obviously they play brass, not strings. But I I had the opportunity to watch them perform, and they, they kind of did – they've crossed the lines of what we've been talking about, right? So they're a small ensemble. Um, and I remember we, we were at the concert, and they were, like, starting. They're like, this is – the point where usually like you're told to put your phones away and blah, 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 blah. And they're like, but we want you to take them out. Like we want you to take videos. We want you to clap. We want you to like engage throughout this. We want you to post on social media. Like they were even taking this ecosystem and taking it further. They were like, we want your friends from high school to know that you're with us tonight watching (laughs) us perform. So um yeah, watching them do their thing was cool because their, their musicianship and their, Uh, level of excellence is obviously very high but they were taking it and creating this casual atmosphere that made you feel like you were in the music with them whether Mm. you were like familiar with traditional concert etiquette or not um you really got to be part of that experience which was cool Mm. yeah that's really interesting i i'll have to check them out further um i think something really powerful about that kind of approach not that I know the kind of details of what they do beyond what you just said but um is like if there is something that you sort of want in terms of an audience dynamic or whatever you can only really get that if they have your trust and Mm. maybe that's a way of doing it you know and like because I think there's a danger of like creating such a casual dynamic that it's not really possible to get any sort of deep value out of the experience but I think that like also creating a casual experience can sort of conjure enough trust that it can be a that it enables a really deep experience i'm envisioning like a an open mic at a coffee house for like casual 
Yeah, I think that's a really good example, actually. I, I played for a while in a like singer-songwriter duo, um, and we did all um, like environmentally-centered mm. music, and we toured by bicycle, and we released our album on like plantable CD paper and stuff like that. And, uh, and a lot of the, and we are both, we both came from a sort of classical background. Um, so a lot of the music was sort of like maybe more classical and intricate than like, um, sort of a, a folk scene might normally be. Um, and so I'm not sure where I'm going, uh, our concerts, <laughs> a big part of the like focus of that. Um, part of that mentality has like carried forward for me um, was the idea of like we're just going to be so honest about our sort of environmental related feelings and create such a sort of like casual friendly trusting but very sacred space that hopefully will invite audiences to allow themselves to sort of be in communion with their own feelings Hmm. also about like environmental stuff and I think that people maybe are like a little bit I don't know I wonder if I'm just thinking about this right now <laughs> that really came up before but um whether music that typically is in more casual settings like maybe folk music or pop or something like that whether that whether those sort of audiences are more prepared to be in touch with themselves mm. or alternatively we sort of like approach classical music a lot of the time with like the understanding that it's supposed to be like really intense and like an in-depth experience like whether that prepares audiences more the only thing I the only kind of like almost answer I have right now is that like both could probably like learn a lot from each other <laughs> Yeah. I um I want to ask you what the CD was so I can link it. Oh, please don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I won't I, ask I, you. I, okay. Yeah, I really, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. No. Yeah, that van's over. It's gone forever. Cool. All right, then I'll, I'll take I'll take a hard left turn. Not hard, soft left turn. Um, What you were saying made me think about also the, the use of language in uh, – casual pop music for this example versus classical music mm -hmm. I know that in my sessions classical music is very non-accessible for a lot of the people I work with because there's no words and so they're just like gone you know mm -hmm. um but obviously as musicians we we understand that like nonverbal communication is a thing and the ability of music to to create emotion and we know through neuroscience that like even if you're not able to consciously realize what the music is eliciting in your body like it's happening um but and so this ties into people being in touch with that so you know do people who listen to pop music like do they need that language in order to help them access that versus people who would choose to listen to classical music? And I don't have an answer. This is also a thought that's just like swimming in my mind. Like, how does that relate? Like, why do people, um, why are they drawn to one versus the other? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I wonder. I, I Yeah, honestly, like that situation of like things that have words or not is so kind of, strange to me <laughs> and confusing because like on the one hand there's this idea that like music and specifically instrumental music is universal because it's not in a linguistic language that mm -hmm. has a barrier of whether you understand that language or not but on the other hand like if there's I think a really easy way in to music is what the words are about <laughs> yes exactly but I wonder how much of that is more steeped in history than anything because I think like classical instrumental music I think carries a lot of baggage for a lot of people not just because it doesn't have words they can sing along to but because it's like literally the you know folk music of the European aristocracy <laughs> and, 
yeah. um, and obviously like has a lot of those sort of um, complicated behaviors that we were talking about with with concerts and yeah just has a lot of kind of pretension about it that's that I I really want to not be there and like somehow I deeply feel that it doesn't have to be but it's such a reality that like there's no there's no opportunity or frankly should there be desire to not contend with that I think Mm. I don't even have a response for that because you just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. Yes. Oh, goodness. I feel like we we could talk and like dive into so many more things, but I want to be cognizant of your time. So do you have anything else you want to get into before the rapid fire questions? Ooh. Um, yeah, I think you're right that we've opened up so many different cans of worms yeah. that I'm like so invested in that they could each be like hour long discussions, Mm -hmm. Um, which is a good thing. Everyone listening is going to like have lots of stuff to chew on. (laughs) Yes. Um, I'm definitely have lots to chew on. Um, Yeah. Nothing, nothing kind of urgent that comes to mind right now. Awesome. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this (laughs) too. Yeah. Are you ready for the rapid fire? Sure. Okay. The first one is coffee or tea. Ooh, I don't drink coffee, and but I'm not like an extremely passionate tea person either. <laughs> That's fine. I'm I'm closer to the tea side though. Yeah. Early bird or night owl? Hmm. Oh my gosh. I think these these are supposed to be easy questions. Um, well, I usually say the questions are short, but your answers don't have to be. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Um. I think. I feel my best as an early bird. Um, if I can, if I can like get that to be routine, I feel great. Um, but night is magic too. Honestly, I think I'm a little bit crepuscular to tell you the truth. Yeah. I really love dawn and dusk a lot. Yeah. Fair enough. That's hard. Um, you're from Canada. I'm from uh, the northern United States. So the summer days are long and the winter <laughs> days are short. Right. <laughs> so it's like either I stay up all the time or I sleep all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Something you'd tell your younger self. Whoa. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> um, well, I think like. In the past couple years, I have learned so much about how good it feels to treat people better (laughs) and just generally like, yeah, I, something that actually really relates to a lot of what we've talked about is um, Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication. Um, that I started sort of reading about and studying. So I guess this whole thing is sort of like the intersection of that and permaculture and string quartet playing. Like that's really sort of what I'm about these days. But um, but yeah, I think like I used to, this is like quite young self, but um, sort of feel like being opinionated and very politically righteous was sort of the most important thing to me. And that ended up coming with like being pretty judgmental of other people and judgmental myself when I didn't like meet my own standards and stuff like that. But I think like, yeah, I've just learned a lot about non-judgment and how good that feels on all angles. And like having, it doesn't mean you can't have self-respect and high standards. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So usually I'd, this is where I'd ask people their music therapy elevator speech, but I'm going to flip it and ask you (laughs) what you think music therapy is. And so, so right. So there's no (laughs) wrong answer because this helps us as music therapists understand how we're perceived and therefore advocate more effectively. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whoa. Um, huh. (laughs) What do I think music therapy is? 
Okay, I think it's like twofold. I think on the one hand, it's the like clinical use of music to like um <laughs> to uh treat people who've come to you for help um, yeah <laughs> but I also think that oh my gosh wow this is actually bringing up like so many questions for me because <laughs> I, I think about like you know how is it that what you do is different from what I do Ooh. um in the sense that like ideally everybody comes away from a musical experience whether that's in a concert hall or a clinic um with some amount of like something you know mm. whether that's like some thought stored deeply in their brain that's going to do something for them later or like a real sense of release or like something that feels a little bit like being therapized in some way <laughs> yeah. um and yet like I really reject that idea for myself like that the idea of like having the intention of helping someone feels like uncomfortable to me that I would I, I don't necessarily like want to go into things with that thought not that that has to be a bad thing I don't know if that's how these therapists like think about it because that like kind of is your job but anyway yeah I don't know I, I'm gonna go think about this after <laughs> well I mean I can tell you from what you've said what is going through my mind um music therapy was born out of the practice of performing musicians going and playing for world war veterans. Uh, and so then they saw the healing power of what was happening. I think this will play into your last part. I don't view myself as like the healer in a clinical relationship, right? Like the person I am working with is doing the self healing and I mm, am just yes. like facilitating that through my knowledge. And this is where we di um, not divulge, divert <laughs> right so you you are trained in like musical excellence and like being the best musician you can be you are far better a far better musician than I will ever be and I'm sure of that um my training is in like the neuroscience the psychology mm, right the use of many different modes of music in order to um create the container to facilitate healing Mm, right is yeah that, our training is definitely sense? different uh, yeah, I just I like to me though the just because what you said um I don't think I'm a better musician I think I'm probably oh. a better technician on yes. my instrument Do you definitely I mean? that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah cool okay that was very insightful for me too thank you that was interesting <laughs> um what is your favorite self-care practice whoa so many oh my gosh uh I uh, I'm not sure if it's my favorite but the thing I'm doing right now that's feeling really good is like the first thing I do when I wake up and get out of bed is like do yoga and then do what I've been calling violin yoga <laughs> which is like yeah you know I'll spend half an hour on the mat like having my body feel good and then I'll spend like 45 minutes or something doing violin things that help me feel spacious and still like physically good. Mm. Um, yeah, which, yeah, yeah, just, you know, like nice open things. Um, because I think I fall into the trap a lot of the time of like, oh, I have to learn all this music and like getting kind of grumpy about it. And that doesn't mm. help the practice of violin playing like feel good physically so yeah yeah I love that I love that you've made your space that made that space for yourself I'm trying yeah America. yeah um something that's currently adding value to your life mm, well so many things I just I just moved here a few weeks ago so it's I think those things are really on my mind that Right now, um, cause I, I moved here, like, you know, it, <laughs> it sounds like sort of silly, but there's like, you know, 
I have this idea that like, you know, if I was in a relationship with someone I had never met and then like was going to move across the continent to marry them, that would be like the stupidest idea ever. Um, but I kind of feel like I did that like with my teacher here. Do you know what I mean? Like I knew nothing about the school. I mean, I've never been to Colorado in my life. Like I don't really know much about like America. Or, like I don't really know like what I'm doing. And uh, anyway, I came all this way and yeah, my teachers are incredible. And the studio that I'm in is so incredible. And like, I feel so already, I barely know these people. And like, I feel so inspired by them and like ready to do things that I'm passionate about and like work really hard. And so I think, yeah, my, my teachers and studio are adding a lot of value to my life right now. Yeah. Talk about trust. Yeah. Mm. Ooh, okay. So usually I ask people one of their favorite things to do in a session. So I'll ask you, what's one of your favorite things, like styles to play or things to do with your quartet? Like what's, what, do you have a favorite? Um, hmm. I'm sure I have lots of favorites, but, oh, I guess like as a rehearsal technique as a quartet, one of my favorite things is this exercise called Live, Breathe, and Die, um, which came to me through, um, I think, members of the Linden Quartet who got it from the Cavani Quartet who got it from the Cleveland Quartet is my understanding of that sort of lineage of this, which is part of why I love it is like that somehow this like really silly exercise is like really steeped in legacy to me. <laughs> but um but anyway, it's like this part silly, part really serious practice of like rehearsing a passage where one person in the quartet is kind of leading and making all the decisions um, and everyone else is live, breathe and dying for them um, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are not judging any of the decisions. They're going with them 100%. So I'm watching your left hand to make sure I'm playing the same amount of vibrato and exactly the same time. And I'm watching your right hand to make sure we're using the same bow speed. We're in the same part of the bow. Uh, we're playing exactly together. Like, But I'm, I'm completely devoted to the success of this um, in your leadership. And then, you know, next time I lead it and then maybe we'll talk about it after that or whatever. But it's just like in the moment, live, breathe, and die for that person's decision-making and um, just completely trusting them and going with it. I like that. Um, I've never referred to what I do. I do a similar thing in, in my therapy sessions sometimes. Mm. So it's, it's cool to hear that transferred <laughs> to a performance setting. That's cool. Yeah. The last question is where can the listeners find you and connect with you? Hmm. Well, I'm I'm very, very slowly building a website, but no promises on that one. <laughs> no worries. Um in the meantime, probably Instagram is the easiest. I'm at Veda Violin. Um yeah, you can I'm also at I'm also Veda Violin at gmail.com if you really wanna chat. Um yeah, I would love to hear anybody's thoughts about any of this or if you love string quartets or if you like ecosystems or if anything in your life feels ecosystem related. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to be thinking that um, all the time. So uh, not to sound like cliche, have you seen Fantastic Fungi? On I have, yes. Yeah, I've seen it. Now, now I'm thinking about that ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, I have a complicated relationship with that movie too, but mm. we don't have to get into it. But <laughs> it, it is interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, and The Secret Life of Trees. Okay, the that Hidden one Life I... Tree? Hidden Life of Trees absolutely is like one of the greatest books I've ever read. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to write that down so I link that in the show. Load. Sure. <laughs> I can't talk and write at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for making the time to talk with me. This is a really great conversation. And uh, I hope we have another one someday. Cause Thank you so much. Like, yeah, hopefully really I'll, cool. maybe I'll actually do some research or something. And then <laughs> I'll have something more concrete to talk about rather than just like things that have floated around in my brain for a little while. I love conversations like that because how often do we get like this 
you know, end of someone, someone's had this experience, they've come to all the conclusions and they give you the conclusion. And it's like, well, what about when you were in the meat of it? Like, what was it like when you were experiencing the thing? Mm. Um, sharing being on the journey, I think is important. And uh, valuing experience over um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's escaping me. But I'm thinking of like, you know, academics versus experience in life. Mm. Like they, they each have their place. And this was this is a very good experiential conversation. And cool. I I'm hope good. the people listening are like ready to go away and think about some stuff. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I definitely got a lot out of talking about it. There's a lot sort of more I want to be thinking about. Yeah, cool. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Thanks. What questions are swimming through your mind right now? Um, like I said, this conversation was a thought-provoking one. We touched on so many things. And yeah, I want to know. I want to know what your thoughts are. Uh, tag me on social media. Share this show with a friend. Let me know what's running through your head, what you thought. This is a conversation that should be continued um, and should include more people in the ecosystem <laughs> of this particular conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. Please consider leaving us a rating and review. Find us on social media. Again, the self-care challenge is coming up. And if you want to be on the wait list and know when the doors to the self-care community open, a link to that will be in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And if you or someone you know is interested in being on the show, please let me know by sending an email to hello at musictherapychronicles.com. This week's quote comes from Emma Goldman and reads, If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. Mm-hmm.